Face front, true believers. This is Modular Media's No Prize podcast, where we talk Marvel movies, Marvel comics, Marvel merchandise, and more. I am your host, Chris Boingo Ryder Gasson, and with me, as always, is the representative of the distinguished competition, the Vacuuminator. And oh, buddy, oh boy, oh buddy, oh boy, no more tracing through the legacies, no more going into the back catalog for now, at least. We're we got something back on the grind. We got a brand new television series special popping off on Disney Plus that we're going to watch. It's Loki time. It's that Tone Loke fella. They gave him a Disney show. Hell yeah. So uh, do we want to talk about like expectations or anything going into this show? Or did you want to just start talking about it? Like, what's our spoiler cap here? What is the plan? Do you have a plan? Are you a plan? What are you? Explain. Well, first off, I'm a lot more calm than you, apparently. I don't know, I just had a manic episode there for some reason. So why don't, um, why don't we go through some of our, like, initial thoughts, and then we'll can dive into some spoilers, and, like, then every episode for Loki we do after this. It's just pure spoiler talk, we're not gonna worry about it. Okay. Uh, and just kind of a general, like, yeah, just vibes. Vibe it. How'd you vibe with it? Uh, I vibe with it pretty hard. I like the tone of it a lot. I like the way it's presenting itself a lot, at least in this first episode. It reminded me a lot of, like, old, old sci-fi. Like, I got a very heavy Ultra Q vibe off of this, or, like, Outer Limits, that kind of stuff. Um, I... From Comic Pop, no, it was a person he was doing the podcast with, but, uh... One of the shows Sal does with other people it's described it as Doctor Who like. I could feel that. Yeah, it's definitely got that kind of tone to it. That kind of like oddball, time travel y, quirky, but very character focused tone to it. This this did a lot, and I'm sure we'll get into it as we go along, but in this episode, there's a lot of confirming stuff about Loki's character that we've just kind of inferred up till now. And it was fun to get to see that happen. Uh, there's a few very, very nitpicky things we can go into with this episode. That um, uh, One of which I was just like, okay, that's funny. But I think a lot of people got more upset with it than they needed to. Um, and another one I was like, oh, you, I get what you were trying to do. But you legitimately just raised more questions than you answered. Oh uh, yeah, that tends to be the, that tends to be what happens when you dive into the weird cosmic background bullshit that is Marvel. Mm-hmm. Because like I, I and I have to ask with a lot of stuff in general here, because this is an area of the comics that you haven't even talked to me a lot about before. How much of this is taken from comics? How much of this is them making a thing up and? Is this a very hard thing in the uh, the comics, or is it played hard and fast in the comics, the whole one timeline thing? Okay, so, in part... Okay, so talk about this, I'm just gonna fucking have to rip the spoiler band-aid off. Uh, yeah, let's go. Let me just, re- real quick, I agree with a lot of that, I think it looks really cool, the vibe is really sweet. I love how each of them are, each of the Disney Plus shows are really definitely aiming for, uh... Uh, an aesthetic that is like unique in their own, mm-hmm. uh, which I, I dig. And this this one's just really cool, all full of anachronisms, full of uh, uh, kitsch and that kind of stuff. I really dig it. So, on one level, kind of technically, yeah, there's one timeline. On another, not really. See, I really wonder. Because just to go into it, um, with the whole thing of how, with that little cartoon, which was one of my favorite parts of the episode. Tara Strong, great performance. Tara Strong's best performance in years, dude. I did not recognize her. I had to go, I was waiting for the credits, because I was like, who's that voice actress? I feel like I recognize that voice, but I can't place it. That's really good. And then it's Tara Strong, and I'm like, that sounds nothing like anything Tara Strong has done in years. Like, I get it now. There's little hints. But mm. but in that timeline, they say, like, there's one sacred time. To- they keep saying that. The sacred timeline. We keep to the sacred timeline that the MCU has always been on. 
because multiverses are bad and multiverses lead to huge cosmic wars. And I'm like, so is this how we s establish the multiverse in the MCU? Is this going to is this going to take us to the MCU being open to the wider Marvel universe to set up for a little movie called Mul In the Multiverse of Madness? We think so because some people are going like, "Oh, this is going to be how they introduce the multiverse and make the multiverse in the MCU." Guys, the MCU is already in the multiverse. And no amount of, like, going, like, oh, yeah, but it's a movie and the comics. No. Kevin Feige's a fan of the comics. That's always been the rule for Marvel anything. It's part of the multiverse. It's just how it works. It yeah, is and you've, one... you've told me this before, but, like, this episode legitimately made me a little scared of, like, oh, are they going to retcon it so the MCU is the first Marvel universe? Because that would be terrible. I don't think so, uh, because realistically, what they described is like, oh, there there was multiple dimensions, and there was a multiversal war, which you could easily call an incursion. Hmm. If someone in the next few episodes goes, we're trying to avoid a secret war, yeah, no, it's part of the multiverse, they're not retconning anything. Oh my um, god, if Miss Minutes was talking about fucking God Doom, I will lose my shit. Yeah, that's what I, because that was my, where my immediate brain went, because fucking Marvel Comics. <laughs> um, that's per, where I think it's going. And here's the thing, technically, there is, like, I wouldn't call them sacred timelines for Marvel traditionally. It's just more of, like, there is an expected path of how things will flow. And if things are changed and modified, the expected path will change and go with it. But the previous changes still exist. They just branch off into multi-different uh, universes. How they described variants in the the little propaganda film. Mm. Uh, a big example of that, well, I can give you two big examples of that, is Days of Future Past. Because basically, the idea was the Marvel comics would eventually lead to the world of Days of Future Past, but because of what Kate Pride does and goes back in time and fixes it, the timeline corrects and goes off and not into Days of Future Past. But the world of Days of Future Past still exists, and it becomes distinct enough, it becomes its own universe. Like, it's that kind of thing. Same thing with Old Man Logan, right? Similar thing with Old Man Logan, a uh, similar thing with uh, MC2, which was the world of what if uh, Mary Jane and Peter Parker's kid wasn't stillborn, and she became May Day Parker. Uh, that was a, a, a branch of the timeline, and it becomes its own little universe. Little things like that. Um, and here's the thing. S uh, movies have been in the Marvel Universe before. They've been in the comics. Uh, a prime example of that is Spider-Verse. They couldn't show their likenesses, but uh, two Spider-Men were talking about, like, yo, I saw a Spider-Man that looked like Tobey Maguire. Dude, I saw one that looked like Andrew Garfield. Weird. They can't show the actress's face because they'd have to buy the rights to it, but... Yeah, I've seen that panel. Uh, things like that does happen. Um, so it, it's not necessarily like unheard of for things like that to happen in Marvel, but being so strict about it is something new, which I think is an interesting take because in the comics, the TVA is a little bit of a joke. Really? Yeah. Um, okay, so... Let's just talk about Loki before we dive too much farther into this, because we need some... We need at least the audience to know where things are going, so I can explain things. Uh, oh, we open up... Oh, yeah, you, you. it's your fucking show. I'm an idiot, sorry. <laughs> uh, we open up with uh, the, the scene from Endgame of Loki escaping, and we find out that he escapes to uh, Mongolia, briefly, before the TVA shows up and arrests him for being and a variant. And immediately I have to stop because I have to I have to dunk on myself a little here. This show taught me a bit of geography. I didn't I didn't know the Gobi Desert was in Mongolia. Because I saw yeah. the Transformers movies when I was very young, I thought it was in the Middle East. No. Oh, that's also where Velociraptors are from. Mm-hmm. Uh by the way, people go watch your dinosaurs wrong. It is a really fun and fascinating little paleontology video series. Uh, I sent you a link to one of the videos. It's in my watch later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but 
basically TVA comes up and goes like, you're a variant. Fuck you. Uh, and arrest uh, Loki. Um, let me make sure I got the right order of this. We're, and then we're at the TVA headquarters as they're processing Loki. And we see a couple of the scenes that we've been seeing in the trailers of his clothes being taken off. And uh, is this, uh, please confirm that this is everything you have ever said. Yeah, that was, that was a funny bit. Uh, also, the uh, guy at the desk taking the test rack. I don't know what the test rack is. He was great. He's a great bit in this whole movie. Uh, yeah, whole... he's yeah, he's yeah. become like a fandom favorite overnight. Uh, then we have the robot confirmation scene, which I just think is like it because that's also great foreshadowing because it's Loki immediately doubting himself. It's like, what if I'm a robot and I don't know it? Yeah, do a lot of people not know they're robots? What? <laughs> I mean, I've uh, met a robot once, I think. Which Wait, is did Loki ever meet Vision? No, no. But he just came from. It's. I found it great because he just came from a movie where there's a joke about life model decoys. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we get to probably one of the most fascinating, like David Lynch scenes in this whole thing. Of the ticket line, yeah. That's the other thing I didn't I didn't um, realize is that yeah, this is this whole episode is very David Lynch esque. It's David Lynch with a layer of like, okay, let me actually explain shit to you so you understand. Yeah, it's David Lynch talking down to you, whereas actual David Lynch is him expecting you to look up at him and figure it out. Yeah. Uh. And for, like, a David Lynch project, yeah, no, that's perfectly acceptable. But for, like, uh, uh, a big mainstream pop culture popcorn thing like uh, Marvel, it, a little explanation goes a long way. Uh, and we get this whole big ex um, exposition about what the TVA's function is within the MCU. Going like, hey, we, fuck, uh, we try and keep time stable. And then we get to the crime scene, which is just fascinating. Because a couple of the time agents, Minutemen, get killed by a variant that they're chasing. And we have uh, a first major character from the comics uh, being introduced, Mobius M. Mobius. Wow. 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 Oh, wow. Look at all these time agents. They're dead. There's a kid. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I also like, I really liked how Mobius, like, calmed, uh, calmed the kid down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they made fun of all the fan theorists who were going on about Mephisto. Yeah. I like, how, I like how Mobius's uh, sort of philosophy seems to be ask questions first, shoot later. Like, yeah. He seems like he's the inverse of everyone else at the TVA. Uh, so should I explain Mobius? Because that basically explains the TVA in its entirety in comics. Yeah, because I didn't know... That the character, I just knew Owen Wilson was in the show. I didn't know until like two days before, thanks to an action figure reveal, that the character was named Mobius. And I was like, is that a reference to the 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 artist Mobius? What? Huh? Okay. So there is a character in the comics known as Mobius M. Mobius. And he's basically the major time agent for the Time Variance Authority. A uh, member of the junior management. I'm looking at the wiki right now. Uh, and he's basically like, if you have to put a figurehead to the TVA in the comics, Mobius is that person. And here's the thing. Mobius is a joke. Not as oh. in like, he's not taken seriously as a character or like, no, he's taken seriously as a character. He's not like treated like a joke. His character creation is a joke because he's based off of Mark Grunwald. Was this the Howard the Duck guy? This no. sounds like something the Howard the Duck guy would do. He was basically uh, a major editor, writer uh, for Marvel for a long time. Uh, th the best way to put it is he was the continuity checker. Yeah, I know who Mark Gr Grunewald is. I've uh, uh, They talk about him a good bit in uh, Marvel Comics The Untold Story, which is a book I've read. Yeah, but like he kept track of continuity. He made sure everything made sense. So when they made the Time Variance Authority, you know, an entire association that tries to make sure time keeps continuity and makes sense, of course it only makes sense to have the figurehead of it be Marvel's real-life continuity checker, who died in 1996 
and the character Mobius came out in 1991. So it's kind of just like a, a little loving tribute mm. to the dude. Um, so yeah, the TVA wasn't like a big, huge honking. TVA is not Shield, you know. Yeah, but they're extrapolating on them and making them something, much like the Eternals are going. To. Much like yeah. Shang Chi is going to be. Yeah, Shang Chi. Shang Chi's always been like a, a a constant side character in Marvel. Like he's the reason Spider Man has Spider Fu. Yeah, but that that that's relatively recent. That's like in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, that was Spider Island. But he was always one of the default. Like, and eh, we need a Kung Fu guy, and eh, we don't want to use Iron Fist. Yeah, Shang Chi. Um, so. Yeah, the TVA is kind of a nothing thing in the comics. It's it's a thing. They've used it every once in a while, but it's weird, big, abstract, cosmic bullshit. So, in other words, they're perfect for a weird side project that doesn't have to lead into another thing, exactly. Yes. And, uh... Oh, Wade Wilson is a member. Oh, it's a different Wade... What? What? There's a Wade Wilson named Loop. He, he joined the Time Variance Authority. Good for him. Yeah. But, yeah, that's pretty much kind of it. Like, looking at the history of the MCU, uh, not the MCU, of uh, the TVA in comics, uh, there's only, like, three major entries, and one of them is just dealing with a trial of She-Hulk. Right. And you know how She-Hulk tends to go with a lot of her comics. It's very comedy and meta. Yeah, she was a uh, fourth wall breaking before Deadpool made it cool. Yeah, because that one was written by the dude who made Howard the Duck. Eve Gerber, was that his name? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I was trying to remember it earlier when I when I called out uh the Mark Grim when I called out Morbi Mobius, goddammit. Um and I couldn't. Mm. But uh should we get back to the episode now? Now that yeah. you've explained comic book bullshit. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of comic book bullshit. So we get to the actual trial of Loki, where he basically presents the idea of like, oh, hey, I'm I'm not at fault. The Avengers went through time. They're the ones who messed everything up. And they were like, no, they were supposed to go through time. Which immediately made me go, oh, no. Because immediately I have the kind of mind that just starts going the same way Loki kind of does later in the episode of just like, why is them doing it any different than him doing it? What the fuck? I think that's a part of the thi uh, thing, but I also think this is them checking their ass because if they didn't do it, the timeline would have been fucked. Because mm -hmm. uh, Thanos had the time gem. Potentially, but also, and this comes up later, the Infinity Stones aren't really treated with the same kind of like all-powerful cosmic reverence in the MCU as they are in the comics. No, the, it... it Here's the thing. We'll get to that, but not like eh. people. I'm people not even talking. I'm not even talking about what they reveal in this episode. I'm just talking about like in in Infinity War when Thanos gets the fully powered gauntlet, he does not become cosmically aware. He just has a big powerful glove. And yeah, no, see, here's the thing. In the comics, that's how it started. And the original Infinity Gauntlet and Infinity War and all those original Jim Starling, yeah, he's just a big, powerful, like, MacGuffin. It's just, I have power. It's through the years of people reiterating on the Infinity Stones that eventually uh, the gems. In the comics, it's the gems. In the movies, it's the stones. Not anymore. Yeah, no. They're... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I listened to that episode of Back Issues last week, sir. I know, I know, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> uh, they're taking parts of that fucking event and using it in this uh, TV show. They are, aren't they? Holy shit. Yeah. Oh my god, what if what if Loki goes to the House of Ideas? Ooh. Oh, who dude. I just aware. had a terrifying I just had a terrifying thought. Hmm. What if we get the one above all in this show and it's fucking CGI Jack Kirby? No. I wouldn't want that. If we if we have a one above all, I want it to keep the idea of the one above all as the writers, so I have it be Kevin Feige. Okay. Oh, speaking of Kevin Feige, we have some things to talk about that later. I have a question about that. I have a big fucking question about that that ties into what we were just saying, but it can wait till later in the episode. Uh, yeah, so basically, the judge goes like, yeah, no, it's bullshit. Uh, you're wrong. 
uh, you can't use magic, so we're gonna go erase you because that seems to be the only uh, uh, like punishment we have for variants. But Mobius yeah. comes in and goes like, "Hey, uh, I'd like to I'd like to use him for our own nefarious purposes." And they're like, "That's a bad idea." And he's like, "I don't care. I can do it. Don't worry. It's fine." Yeah, but I'm Mobius. I am Mobius. I'm Mobius. Have you seen have Have you seen those magical sticks? I mean, wow, they really hurt. You don't want to hit him with that. Not yet. Mobius. I voice a car in cars. My dog died in that one movie. It was really sad. Did you see it? A lot of people saw it and they went, wow. I, I saw it in a lot of Wes Anderson movies. Wow. <laughs> We're harping on it a lot, but like. Fucking, He's great in this. Yeah, you can bar- he barely does that part, that, that, that area of his voice. He barely goes to that sort of upper wow area at all. No, but he's still very Owen. He, he's that relaxed Owen Wilson. He kind of like, hey man, come on, don't fucking. Bo-. It, it's he's. I'm trying it's a to less be less slimy your... Bill Mo- uh, Bill Murray. It's a less slimy Bill Murray. Yeah, he's playing a character who's trying to be your friend, whereas a lot of the roles that he's known for, a lot of the wow roles, are just him being obnoxious. Yeah. So, uh, Shanghai Noon is good. I don't know if I've seen that, actually. It's the Western with him and Jackie Chan. I think I've seen that. It has a sequel where they go to fucking England. Because of course it does. Yeah. Uh, But basically, Mobius uh, takes uh, Loki to to an interrogation chamber and uh, shows him um, the VHS tape of uh, the uh, Avengers Infinity Saga. Mm -hmm. Going like, hey, look at all this shit that goes on. Wow. You know, Loki, you're doing a lot of posturing, but uh, I think we all know, plays the Infinity Saga, you're a bit of a dipshit. You're a bit of a shitter. You're a bit of a sad, lonely, angry shitter who just kind of meandered through life. And I'm trying to give you a chance to do something with yourself. Why don't you straighten the fuck up? Hey, hey, hey. Why why are you doing the things you do? Well, because, uh, because I need to control the weak, because the weak will do so many things to, to... to claw at power. I feel like their lives aren't pointless. He's, yeah. he's, he's fucking advocating for capitalism. No, Loki isn't. Loki isn't. It's not capital. No, nah, it's not really. It's the same kind of ideal of like the lesser need to need someone to strive to be. They need to strive to be more and perpetually be doing that so they feel like their lives have meaning. It's not capitalism, though. That's just like a byproduct of it. But yeah, but that's like our main complaint with capitals. No, the main complaint of capitalism I have is the fact that the few have the most and the many can't have. That yeah, the byproduct of that creates a byproduct of that. It all leads back yeah, to but that's one like, central thing. <laughs> that's like <laughs> complaining about the runny that's like saying, Oh man, I hate runny noses. Why? A fucking colds? Like, no, you <laughs> fucking hate the cold. Not the fucking runny nose. Hey, fair. Jesus fucking <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Know where the target is before you take a shot, bruv. That's that's never been my way of life. Also, welcome to modular media, everyone. We hate capitalism. <laughs> but apparently yeah. we don't know why. <laughs> I know why. So uh eventually uh uh Mobius does get called away to do something real quick. And uh Loki uh kind of Hey, 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 you skipped over the part of the episode that everybody was most excited to see. Yeah, but here's the thing. It was just kind of showing, like, Loki is mischievous. He he do, he did pranks on Earth. Yeah, he's B.D. Cooper. Look at him yeah. being B.D. Cooper. Isn't this fun and quirky? Isn't this a great, ex- a great little scene that we can clip out and shop around on talk shows? Like, legitimately, I went into the episode excited to see how they were going to contextualize that. And I actually thought, like, oh, we might not see that till two or three episodes in, because it'll be a it'll be a mission. He goes on for the time variance authority somehow. And then seeing it like that, I was like, oh, they literally just had a dumb idea and needed a way to get it into the show. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Mobius and Mobius eventually does get called away uh, for a purpose. For a reason, uh, basically, uh, more Minutemen are uh, found dead, and uh, he needs to kind of deal with it some. And when that happens, Loki, uh, Loki does go through it first. So Loki basically takes the VHS tape of. Uh, no wait, I'm wrong. Mobius gets called away, and uh, eventually Loki figures out a way to escape because he uh, takes the little uh, time 
trinket thing out of Mobius's pocket that uh, loops him. So now he can move freely about without being detained. And, and he can also goes, do that shit to other people if he gets the collar on that. So he goes and finds Casey and goes like, hey, give me give me the Tesseract, the, the powerful thing I wanted. And Casey, uh, and Casey's like, what the fuck is that? What is a fish? What? Which is great, because here's the thing. In the comics, the TVA are all clones of a like a like a thing like a person a thing and are just like repeatedly created just to run this thing they don't have any lives they're just they're just mach- people being recreated for machine for like doing this they're constructs but they know they're clones they are full living beings and people they're just this is the only thing they know mm-hmm. so it's a little fucked up a little bit, a little bit. That's another kind of like David Lynch sci-fi Doctor Who type thing. Um, but uh, yeah, so Casey gives him the Tesseract, and as he's looking in the drawer, we see that it's actually the prop drawer. Yeah, it's full of Infinity Stones from different variant timelines. And they and- have so many of those, apparently, that various people around the TVA use them as paperweights, which sent people into a fucking tizzy. It's almost as if different dimensions have different physical properties. Mm-hmm. Like, this has been a thing since fucking 2000? Like, I have them here. I have seen a total of 12 memes about this shit. My favorite of which is uh, somebody tweeting out the Infinity Saga poster collage and just saying, all this was over a damn paperweight, dot, dot, dot. Jesus fucking Christ. This has been a known property of the Infinity Gems forever. They only work in their home dimension. (laughs) But I've only seen... But Boingo, I've only seen two movies. I just glossed over those other ones. I went to see those two movies because everybody was talking about them. And in those two movies, they're cool rocks. They're just cool rocks that give you powers, right? You can kill people with them, right? No, but this has been a thing forever. They only work in their home dimension. They don't even work in pocket dimensions. You take an Infinity Stone to the negative zone, they ain't gonna work. There you go. Uh, No, like, uh, the first time I know of this happening in the comics was in JLA Avengers when the Infinity Stones got sent to the DC Universe and Darkseid collected them and he had them on a gauntlet. He's going like, I know these have power. I've seen... uh, I've seen things about it, all that kind of stuff, and he tries to use them, and it's like, that nah, doesn't work. Here, I don't care about it anymore. Mm. Yeah, like, legit, that's a scene from uh, JLA Avengers. Read JLA Avengers. It's a really good comic book story. Nice. Folks, everybody. Yeah, no, the people who are freaking out about this, just, guys, it's an alternate dimension. This happens. Yeah. I kind of got the sense that the TBA was supposed to be a pocket dimension anyway. Like, it's a space that exists outside of time. Yeah, um, in they're in a thing called the Null Time Zone in the six one six. At best, I'd say it's like there's a Time Variance Authority connected to every Marvel universe, yeah. and it's just like the TVA kind of is in the in between of all of them, kind of. Yeah. That's how I describe it. Of course, we're at this point. It's like trying to head canon, goddamn Marvel lore and stuff because like. Because honestly, this fe- this show fed into my personal headcanon of how timelines and alternate dimensions work in Marvel, which is like, you'll have a, a main timeline, a main thing, and you'll have several smaller dimensions kind of encircling it as like a string going through reality. Like spaghetti webbing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like spaghetti webbing. And every once in a while, part of that spaghetti webbing will clump up, and it'll break apart, and there'll be different timelines. That will be like... Uh, 1805, the Neil Gaiman timeline, or Days of Future Past, Age of Apocalypse. Whatever uh, the fuck Moira's life is. The variety of Moira lives. Like, the, those things. All that kind of stuff. Uh, and if it becomes strong enough, it eventually just breaks off from the other dimension and becomes its own string. And then it starts building its own negative zone and its own this and its own that and its own everything. It's own microverse. Makes sense. Uh, that's my personal headcanon about it. Um, but uh, Loki having been uh, shown the futility of uh, 
his quest in this pocket universe, decides to go back to the uh, interrogation chamber and uh, go like, okay, what else did uh, what else did the future Loki go through? And he basically rewatches all of the uh, Infinity Saga, including he Ragnarok. Sees, he sees his mom die. He says he sees his dad die. He sees Asgard get blowed up. Him and four make good, and then him fucking die. Yep. And like there immediately we go like, all right, cool. He's caught up with the original Loki. He's went through some of that character development. It's slightly different, so we can play with that. But he's the Loki you remember at the end of Ragnarok and the beginning of uh, Infinity War. Also, Thanos was right. No resurrections that time. Right. No, no resurrections. That Loki is dead. This is a different Loki. In fact, we might be even able to call him e What? Oh, God. I get to explain e Oh, Okay. Lord. Um... You know the Loki you've been seeing in comics recently? Yeah. That's technically not the same Loki from, like, Avengers number one. Mm. They're two different Lokis. Because at one point, Loki, the original, as uh, Loki, uh, decided, hey, I want to fuck with fate. And whenever I get killed, I'm not going to return, resurrect like I would normally do. I'm going to be reborn as a brand new person. Kid Loki. Remember Kid Loki? I that's do. Where Kid Loki comes from. So Kid Loki growed up. That's what that's what current Loki is. Technically, yeah, it was accelerated, but there was also a thing called E. Cole, and there was aspects of Loki that imbued on him, and then the old Loki spirit like tried to imprint himself on the new Loki. Uh, it's a variety of things, and I think Lady Loki might be involved in there yeah, somewhere. I was gonna say, when the fuck was Lady Loki? I think Lady Loki might have been, like, right before that. Okay. Um, Because, like... Also, we forgot to talk about something with this episode that I just noticed because my episode played past it. Got open on another monitor. Did you, uh, did you notice a certain cameo while Loki was, uh, escaping and running around the TVA? No. uh... When he first winds back to that first room, somebody is brought in by a, by another Minuteman in the background, and a lot of people notice... That uh, that person looks like a certain brunette woman from a certain series in this uh, this franchise, yeah. and a lot of people are theorizing: Does that have anything to do with what one Stephen Rogers did? Eh, maybe that'd that'd be fucked though. Yeah, because <laughs> they fucking delete that universe and uh, delete yeah. anybody. Yeah, no, Steve got his happy ending. Don't worry about it. He was deleted by Mobius. Oh god. Yeah, no. That'd be that'll that'll be the way they'll turn the TVA on everybody. Oh yeah, by the way, they fucked over Steve's happy ending. What? Fuck you, TVA, you're assholes. Hmm. Uh but Loki sees uh his character development in full. He grasps it. He comes to terms with it. He he's he's that Loki now, to an extent, and all that jazz. He's just, he's just wrecked by it. And Mobius comes in and goes like, hey, you doing okay, buddy? And you want to like, play nice now? And Loki just basically goes like, yeah, I've been trying to use the Tesseract. It hasn't been working. And Mobius goes like, all right, so why were you doing all that dumb bullshit you were doing? And basically Loki goes like, I was lashing out. I wanted to have control of my life because I felt like I didn't have it, you know? Like, one of the memes I actually liked out of this episode was something somebody posted of uh, a screen cap of Loki watching his own death next to a screen cap of uh, Ben Solo um, from Rise of Skywalker, like, right before uh, It's Totally Not a Force Ghost Han shows up, spoilers for Rise of Skywalker, um, next to each other, and the caption is just, when you realize that all this time you've been being a complete whiny asshole, but your family has been loving and supporting you along the way, just hoping you'll get better. Yep. Because ultimately, Loki, Loki always felt like Thor was making fun of him, doing all that kind of stuff. That's been a major part of Thor and Loki's character dynamic for years. And Loki and Loki's just smile when he hears Loki, uh, Thor say, I love you, brother. You're not going to change the way I want you to, but at the end of the day, you're still my brother, and I care about you, that kind of stuff. And it's just like, oh, man. It's just great character work from Tom Hiddleston. 
And then he goes like, all right, cool. So why do you need me? Why are you try- going through all this to try and try and help me so I can help you? Why, 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 why? And Mobius goes like, okay, so I need help capturing a variant. This variant is another Loki. And then we get a little brief uh, scene of a couple minute men coming down on a, a, a time thing, a time crime. I think happening. it said it was the late 1800s. Late 1800s, but it was a shovel from like the year 3000. Yeah, it looked like stuff and Kang would be lugging around. Which, uh, that was the that was the thing. When Loki was asking Mobius who he's looking for, for a split second I went, what if it's fucking Kang? And then I well, remember we saw Quantumania. Kang's wife. Yeah, and then I remember Quantumania and I was like, fuck. We saw Kang's wife. In this episode? Yeah, the judge. That's who that is? Yeah, I don't remember the character's name, but like that's who it's supposed to be, essentially. Okay, I thought she was just a random judge. No, no, no. Um, and eventually, uh, we see the Minutemen get killed by a cloaked figure. Uh, if it's supposed to be Loki, why is they cloaked? It's Lady Loki. It, it's fucking Lady Loki. I mean, I don't know if you saw, but Tom Hiddleston posted a photo of himself titled Loki's United, and he was standing next to a woman, and people were like, what the, who the fuck is this woman? And, and he just goes, oh, she's playing Lady Loki. Yeah, Lady Loki's happening. Because they've also uh, confirmed through props and other material, basically like, yeah, no, we're we're doing the gender fluid thing with Loki like they do in the comics. So, Lady Loki is the villain of this show. Maybe it'll end with Kid Loki becoming a thing. I don't think it's going to end with Kid Loki. I think it's going to end with, like, God of Stories Loki. Like, Tom Hiddleston's going to fully reform and become the God of Stories like Loki is in the comics right now. Mm. Um, also, I like that they're using Lady Loki, because Lady Loki was, like, straight-up villain in the comics. She never had any redeeming qualities. I didn't know that. I've had no exposure to her. Um, no, it's more, like, recent Lokis that have more, like, anti-hero kind of qualities. Up till then, like, Loki was pretty full-on baddie. I mean, I've read... I've experienced some older Avengers stuff, and he comes off as kind of, like, just, like, a cackling jackass Starscream-type guy in that. Oh, he's very much... Uh, Loki was very much like that for most of his life. <laughs> until the new Loki. And that's when he decided, uh, through a variety of things, to become the god of stories and not the god of lies. Uh, and that's a very dis- important distinction for him now. That's a big thing they play around with in this episode is Loki goes, oh, I, I was fucking around with time because I'm the god of mischief. And Owen Wilson is just like, you don't seem very mischievous to me. You seem like you like hurting people, bud. What's up with that? And he's like, I don't like hurting people. It's just the only way I know how to do things. Hurting people is the only way to make my dad notice in a roundabout way of him subscribe, like... Which, that, oh, that's an idea that's been around in the MCU fandom since Avengers 2012. But, like, that kind of hurts more now, knowing about Hela and how big a fan of Hela Odin was back in the day until he couldn't control her anymore. Yeah, and then Odin was like, all right, I'm going to actually try with these two fuckers. Mm-hmm. And hey, one out of three, Dad. <laughs> no, Odin. That's actually a pretty shit record. Yeah. Hey, it's going to be two out of three, technically, at this point in time, because Loki's improving. He's becoming a better person. I don't know if that works post-mortem, but okay. Yeah, I'm just, just saying this. Budget, budget. We're outside of time. He, it, it, Odin's alive and not alive at the same time. Schrodinger's Odin. <laughs> God, if Anthony Hopkins shows up in this show, I don't think he will. I would be fucking shocked if he does. But, like, if he showed up in this, that would be hilarious and probably, like, the most devastating bit of character development. Yeah, no. This is, uh, but this is an exciting first episode of for everything that they're kind of setting up. It's exciting, but, like, in... Not in a way that any of the other first episodes have been, because the other first episodes have been like, whoa, what? Oh, it's crazy. What's going on? Oh, the MCU. Yeah, man. And this is just like, okay, this is different. What? Oh, yeah, Loki is a character. This is the closest I'd say the MCU has gotten to trying to be prestige television. You know, like Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones. Yeah. 
that more subdued storytelling with a long serialized format where one division was immediately like, Hey, we're trying to be a weird head trip. And Falcon and winter soldier was, Hey, we're a longer Marvel movie. You remember eighties action movies. Cool. Let's go. Let's do it. Geopolitical conflict, <laughs> racial politics in modern America. Oh, remember the refugee crisis? Fuck yeah. God damn it. Though, realistically, there were 80s action movies that dealt with uh, racial politics in America. Yeah, I love Dirty Harry. I was thinking of Beverly Hills Cop, but... (laughs) (laughs) Which I think is a more accurate comparison. Uh, No, overall, what what are you... How are you feeling about Loki so far? Uh, it's solid. It's not thrilling me like the other two did, but I'm I'm very much on board. I'm like, yeah, this is a vibe. This is a vibe. I can fuck with this. I think it's trying to be thrilling. I think it's just trying to be engaging because there's a lot of dialogue. It's a very dialogue heavy, heavy yeah. thing. And that makes sense. I mean, like, think about it. Loki is one of the most universally beloved uh mcu characters he was one of the first characters that people really latched on to with the mcu remember that remember that video from like what feels like eons ago around the time avengers was either just coming out or was just about to come out and there was just this video of people women screaming like they were seeing the fucking beatles in the 60s at tom hiddleston coming onto stage at comic-con no that was uh avengers age of ultron Mm. because he comes out and goes uh, uh he says lines from avengers tw- uh, 2012 yeah and he was in costume and in character and there was some dude who shouted my wife loves you <laughs> that was a trip man that was a time yeah people immediately got into loki and then like they just went like all right cool let's actually make him a soft boy that people won't feel bad about simping over <laughs> yeah oh like Here's the thing. This episode is a lot of setup and a lot of just like trying to lay. It's trying to lay all the groundwork for like, here's all the themes we're going to be dealing with of uh, self determination and uh, determinism and all that kind of stuff. Here's reestablishing Cody's uh, Loki's character arc and his place as a character and all this kind of stuff. Here's Mobius, his vibe. Here's the mystery that they're trying to solve. Here's the TVA. It was all just like, here's all the information you're going to need to understand the next five episodes. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Have fun. Yeah. Yeah. So we're just going to have to watch next week's episode. Yeah. We're back on the grind. And I only want to do that one more time. What do you mean? You don't want to do the next MCU show? No, I mean, I only want to do that. Well, I'm only going to do that joke one more time in this episode, if at all. Okay. So you've gathered up some toy news and merch news. So we're doing toy news before comics? Yeah. That's how we've been doing it. It's oh. a, it creates a nice barrier between trying to explain stories and we can just freak out about things. There's so much shit that goes on every week now that like i forget the format for our shows sometimes hey why don't you explain some of the other shit that goes on every week okay uh so you know how there is a disney plus themed wave of marvel legends with the build a figure falcon cap wings yeah that's and that's been hitting stores over the last few weeks i actually saw um i saw sam wilson cap at target today uh, ding, ding, grab him because th- you got to get the whole rest of the wave to make the wings. But uh, um, there is actually going to be a Target exclusive addition to this wave that was revealed, uh, like, I think the day after we recorded last week. Wow. It's Mobius and Mobius in Marvel Legends. Wow. wow. The hair looks a little off, but not horribly. But the face printing is extraordinarily on point. Yeah, he looks fine. He looks good. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to screw up man in suits. Yeah. Also, I just remembered, I wonder if we're going to see this motherfucker in uh, Loki. Who is that motherfucker? This is Justin Alphonse Gamble, also known as uh, Professor Gamble. I'm going to give you one guess what he's a parody of. The Mad Hatter? Nope. Doctor Who? Yep. Wow. 
I would be fine with him showing up only if he's played by an actor that has played the Doctor. Well, I mean, Doctor Who is Marvel canon. Uh, five, 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 six. Oh. Genuinely also, Marvel canon. Also, check out Compound Hulk. Oh, hey, it's from the one cover with Red Hulk. Yeah. Uh, it, this will be a Walmart exclusive uh, later this summer. Yeah, it's just trying to recreate the uh, the cover. Which is a neat idea for a toy, but that would make much more sense for, like, a Hasbro Pulse exclusive than a Walmart full yeah. release. Also, it's kind of funny that they didn't make it a Target exclusive, because for a while there, anything Marvel Legends that was red went as a Target exclusive. Like, that's how they released Red Hulk. Huh. Um, but, uh, I don't know, I don't know, we've never talked. Are you super into prop replicas? Because I opened this just in case. I didn't even understand what you just said. Just show me anyway. They're making Cap Shield from Winter Soldier. Oh, that's neat. The uh, the dulled uh, stealth colors. The blue raspberry. Yeah, the best icy flavor. It does look. It does look nice. It's a it's a solid way to get more use out of that mold because they already did a regular Cap Shield. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's cool. Uh, but the coolest thing I think that got revealed this week is a is another import thing like that whole cluster we flipped out over last week. Uh, because um, what company is this again? Uh, SB Action. I have mm -hmm. not I have not heard much about this company. They did a uh, they did one other Spider Verse figure. I think they did Miles as well. But they are doing into the Spider Verse. Peter Parker, not Peter B. Parker, not Peter Parker, but a figure that can be either Peter Parker or Peter B. Parker, depending on what parts you put in. Yeah, that's nice. That's really cool. Yeah. I like the different head sculpts. I like how uh, chunky they are. Mm -hmm. Oh. Very plus, animation. <laughs> plus those uh, paying attention. Very animation accurate. Um, and also, whereas most Peter B. Parkers have been coming with his hobo clothes... In this, they instead opted to just give you a massive fucking gargoyle to display him on. That's nice. Oh, wait a second. Hold on. They give you two different ab pieces. Yeah. That's what I was saying. You can make him Peter Parker or Peter B. Parker. No, I was just thinking, like, oh, is it just going to be, like, the same body sculpt? No, they give you uh, two different body sculpts so you can have the punch. Nah, man. This is imports. Imports go hard like that. I love how even the webbing kind of has some of that... Uh... The fuzziness that the movie had. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, it's a really solid looking figure, honestly. God damn! I just holy shit! That's the burger mouth from the licking the fingers from eating the burger. Yeah, that's another like scene specific thing this figure is doing to differentiate itself because none of the other, uh, even the import Peter B. Parkers don't have that besides this one. And the glasses, like no, this is great. The coffee cup. Oh man. All the yeah. different web varieties, solid spaghetti webbing, not bad. They could be a little bit more McFarlane-y. McFarlane has always done the best spaghetti web. Mm -hmm. Also, I love that there's like a big eyes wide and shock Spider-Man mask head. Not enough Spider-Man figures do that. It's always either just neutral eyes or neutral eyes and squinted eyes. I like the big eyes wide. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, this is a really cool, really unique release. And then getting into uh, DC figures, Todd has been very busy this week. Todd seems like he's a very busy man. So first and foremost, we have the... What is this an exclusive to? Walmart exclusive unmasked red hood. That certainly does look like a, a biker. Mm -hmm. Next up... <laughs> okay, now I get why you're complaining about the swords. Yeah. That was something we were talking about off mic. A lot of anything DC basically now, you either can't give it guns as accessories or you can't uh, show guns as accessories in the solicitations or the promotional photos because Warner's has a really weird new policy in place about not selling toys of guns because gun violence in America is a bad thing. And yes, I agree. But also there's a difference between selling role play toys of guns and action figures that come with guns, especially characters who are supposed to have guns. Yeah. Like, I mean, those, uh, the crowbar, nice. Yeah, but those, the Suicide Squad figures we talked about last week, 
Everyone has a sword. No one's got a gun. Oh, boy. <laughs> Um, but, uh, another Walmart exclusive I have here is, uh, the White Knight Asriel Suit of Sorrows. That looks like an alternate color in a fighting game. It really does. I it's mean, a, like, sure, but like... It's, a, it's an interesting concept, but I have no, I don't even have attachment to regular Asriel, honestly. I don't give a shit about Asriel. I mean, what do you, I mean... I got Asriel number one. I don't think I've ever read that. <laughs> I th that's the thing is like I could give a shit about Asriel. I've just never had the chance to. I mean, they haven't done anything with him in like what years, other than like side continuity shit. No, like no. alternate worlds. He has little tiny booties. Look he at does. his little booties. Yeah, look at him. Look at that little scamp there. It has Look like little toddler scamp. booties. Look at that scamp on his holy crusade of killing people. Also, I, I'm not a big fan of his red mustache. Yeah, that's weird. It looks better when it's like the full like black on red because it doesn't look like as much of a mustache. Mm -hmm. Also, in the comic art that they put on the packaging, that encompasses almost his entire piece, his entire face. It it also goes over like the uh, the domino mask. So I think this is probably like a misprinted prototype. Maybe. Or it's just exactly just a repaint. Uh, speaking of repaints, look, it's Battle Damaged Heavy Metal Batman. Target exclusive. Neat. Yeah. That's that's a sh certainly a thing. That's the thing with this line. It goes through, like, waves of, like, here's some cool new stuff. Here's a billion repaints of it. Because we want to give you unique sculpts for characters. But also, we have to get our money's worth on these molds. So if we can do a battle damage, if we can do an unmasked version, here you fucking go. Uh, speaking of which, uh, hey, look, it's John Stu. It's uh, Hal Jordan versus Dawn Breaker, and that was not a screw up. That was that was me intentionally stopping to say how Don the the other one because they released John Stewart first as a single pack. And then they were like, okay, here's a two-pack with Hal that reuses the Jon Stewart body. Yeah, that's fair enough. Mm -hmm. I really? thought that was the um, Bat Lantern. Uh, not from Dark Knight's Metal, from the Elseworlds. The original. Nope. That that's, is, kind that is the dark, that's the Dark Knight's Metal one. Because that's what's new and hot right now. And it reminded Todd of the 90s. Is it really new and hot? Or is it just a thing that DC's trying to... It reminded Todd of the 90s, which made him happy and nostalgic. What he has to do is go look at his... To make action if wants, figures again. If he wants to look... If he wants to re remind it of the 90s, all he has to do is look at his own goddamn comic. <laughs> it's still set in the 90s, Todd. That's the thing, is Todd fucking... The the whole reason this line happened, because a lot a lot of the first few waves have been Dark Knights and Death Metal stuff, was just Todd going like, Oh shit, Scott, Greg, this stuff is awesome. Can I make toys of it? Should really talk to corporate about that. I fucking will. Uh, um getting away from uh that brand of 90s nostalgia, uh hey, they're making a bat cycle for the White Knight Batman. Look at it. Neat. I like the White Knight Batman. It's definitely one of the better Elseworld stories in recent years, though I haven't read the 17,000 side stories and sequels they've made of it now. Yeah, that's a... You know what? That that should be a thing Marvel and DC do. Just take like a big, a big creative writer that they really, really trust and just go like, all right, cool. Here's just an ongoing, you can tell any story in your universe that you want. But it's in your universe, it's in your own continuity, it's your own little side project. Mm -hmm. Tell any story you want. That's kind of become an unspoken trend in the last few years. And, like, I remember they were trying to get it off the ground even a few years before that. Because, hey, you remember that Superman book that Max Landis wrote? Yeah. That was supposed to be the start of something like that. And yeah. then we all found out he was a secret asshole. Yeah. Here's your lesson of the day, kids. Don't be like Max Landis. But imagine, like, just giving, like, Donny Cates and Chip Zdarsky. It's like, all right, cool. Here's just an ongoing book labeled Chip Zdarsky's Marvel Comics. 
and it's just you can tell the you, you can tell any story you want in the Marvel your version of the Marvel universe. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, but lastly, and honestly, lamestly, uh, just revealed today, Todd McFarlane designed Wonder Woman direct to action worst. figure. Not, it's not the worst redesign. It's not a bad. It just looks like Angela. It looks like Angela. It looks like it's going off of the psychotic warrior princess take on Wonder Woman, which I am not a fan of. I don't like that's not Wonder Woman to me. Also, this is like the f- the the sixth Wonder Woman in this line now, and we still haven't gotten a classic comic Wonder Woman yet. Yeah. Big dumb. But uh, that is the toy news. Should we do comics? Yeah, so why don't you, uh, do you have any comics you want to talk about first? Yes. What'd you read? What do you, what what do you think I read? Does Supergirl come out? I don't remember. No, that's, that's not for another couple weeks. What else? What else could I have read this week? I thought you were going to be taking a break, sir. I read all of X of Swords in two nights. Holy buddy boy, that's 11 issues a night. Yeah. Okay, okay, buddy, okay. I wanted to to watch the Back Issues episode. (laughs) Fair enough, fair enough. So I watched, I listened to it at work on Friday, and now I don't know where their thoughts end and my thoughts begin, except for the ones that are simping for magic. Yeah, I mean, that's very much just a you thing. Yeah. So overall, it's good. I like it. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> uh, it was a lot. It was a fucking lot, dude. It goes through some things, man. <laughs> uh, that being said, I am I am so happy for Apocalypse. He gets to go home with his wife. He gets to go and try and be happy. He's been the bastard. The uh, the no. Listen, I'm just trying to help. No, you're a fucking asshole. Of this, of this section of the Marvel Universe for the longest time. And now he finally gets to go and be happy. I did my job, I accomplished the things I wanted to accomplish, and now I get to go fuck my wife. And she's like, maybe in another few weeks, buddy. We got a lot of catching up to do first. <laughs> oh, man. Honestly, though, Apocalypse has some fucking choice moments in this whole thing. Oh, my God. Uh, and, like, listening to that Back Issues episode and them saying that Apocalypse fans hated his portrayal in, in the story, I was like, well, Apocalypse fans don't like Apocalypse then, because that's the thing I always get from every fandom of, oh, I just want my favorite characters to be happy. And I'm like, your heart's in the right place then, but you maybe don't know how to write the best stories, because conflict has to be a thing. They can be happy in the end, but conflict has to be a thing. And this is a story where there's a lot of conflict, and then he's happy in the end. So, uh, any overall things you kind of want to bring up about the X of Swords event? Um, yeah, I still really don't like the fucking Captain Britain Corps multiverse bullshit. It's still really hard for me to get my head around, and I'm glad that one character got supremely fucked over in the end. I mean, it's just, it's not that hard. What are, what aren't you getting about it? What what's it's it's just it's that side of Boingo Core that I'm like, look, I get it, but it's not for me. Okay, here's a here. Let me explain it in DC. Every single universe in DC has a Superman, right? Uh huh. Now imagine that Superman is just the protector of that version of the universe against the other universes. So the other universes are constantly trying to beat each other up. Vaguely, it's more of like people in those universes might want to fuck with your universe, and you got to keep balance and make sure everything's you work together with the other ones and you keep everything running ship tight. It's like multiversity, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, also, Doug got a wife and he's big happy, and I'm big happy for Doug, yeah. Uh, also, it's the one person who he can't immediately understand, and then, like he's immediately like, Oh, this is interesting. I'm immediately interested in you as a person. Oh, I could fuck with this. Literally. <laughs> now, what about she isn't like some weird nefarious, like, oh, it's some, oh, there's some plan and machination. No, she looks at this tiny dude who can just speak every language and go like, 
This is my boy, and I will fuck him for life. He is mine, and no one else can have him. Yeah. Uh, also, um, yeah, you were right. I like Jean Grey a lot now. Uh, Sue Storm has stiff competition for mo- best mother in the universe. Ah, oh, damn. Cyclops and Jean fucking became parents of the fucking comic universe in this one thing because she just hears her baby boy go mom we ain't doing so good and she immediately goes like all right i'm removing like i am galvanizing the entire population we are taking this giant spaceship into this alternate dimension that we don't even know if we can do this and professor x and magneto are like but gene then you can't sit on the cow and there and she just goes shut the fuck up get My out baby of the way boy's in trouble <laughs> and Cyclops is just there going like, yes, yes, honey, tell them off, do it. Yes, dear. Uh, mm-hmm. Let me go get the spaceship. Do-do-do-do. I love, like, it's the sound the spaceship makes. Do-do-do-do. Do-do-do-do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Also, um, I love the joke that they brought that, uh, that what the, like, because they kind of set it up. Because the whole premise is they have this whole big, like, 10 on 10 sword fighting tournament, sword fighting tournament. It's it's a fucked up game show that Saturnine just fucking plays on them to eventually get to what she wants. Yeah. It's just oh, like, ah, do this. Ah, do this. Wolverine was like, because I've been kind of down on Wolverine in these comics. I've been like, I don't care about vampires. I guess that other story is okay. But Wolverine has some great fucking moments in this. Fucking having to go get a new Muramasa and then being like, yo, I can't believe you're not Captain Britain anymore. Will you please just fuck her so we can go home? No? All right. I'm going to stab the bitch. Oh, shit. This leads to the end of the world. Sorry. (laughs) Wolverine was peak Wolverine in this. It was great. But since they only had the Krakoa only had nine mutants going. Technically, they could have had an extra sword, and they did at the very end because sword comes in. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. I like that. Um, also, just the political ramifications of there being another Krakoa right next to Krakoa, and them being a bunch of angry like Klingon motherfuckers who With just want to fight. Oh, oh no! And their entire Quiet Council is full of Omega level mutants. Mm-hmm. If you don't understand what how powerful an Omega level mutant is, that's Magneto, Storm, mm. Iceman, Jean Grey, Kid Omega. Mm-hmm. Was it, it Kid Omega created as like a joke? Grant Morrison having a joke about the Omega level mutant thing. I think so, but he's kind of evolved into. Oh, he has. He's a different, a, a different kind of joke. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, Hellions going on their fucking comedy side quest. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. When they show back up and they're just like, "Yo, we did the thing." Fa- you didn't need to do the thing. What? You didn't need to do the thing. What? Um, it's so fucking great. Oh man. No, it's just solid, solid all around shit. It's good. It's- also, the the ending of like. Apocalypse putting on the mask and going like, "All right, cool. I you're now taking control of my body, but I have enough willpower to just like say no." Yeah, strength doesn't come from muscles; it comes from mental fortitude. Yeah, it's great. Uh, yeah, no, definitely, it's a good event. definitely one of the best events I've read in a while. Uh, maybe the best. Yeah, I can call it a current event because it was last year. Um, best current event I have read since Fear itself. Because I, I have either skipped or not liked a lot of current events since then. And Fear itself happened, like, right after I first got into comics. There's a couple events that are, like, up there and good after Fear itself. Uh, Avengers, no, blah, blah, blah. no Surrender? I, I have no idea what that is. Um, It was an Avengers event where basically all the A-level Avenger characters, Thor and all them, get taken off the board. And Game Master and a different Game Master, like, it's, it's just explained in the story, basically play a game on Earth. And Game Master purposely picks Earth because he knew the Avengers would fuck up the game and make it null and void. So neither player wins and thus, like, everything kind of ends on his terms, you know? Mm-hmm. 
I mean, obviously there is Secret Wars, but Secret Wars was something I read very post mortiously. Yeah. Um, like, uh, here's how much of a fucking scrub I am. I didn't read Hickman's FF until after the B-Mask video. Yeah. But uh, how do you feel about, like, how they structured this event? Because I actually really enjoy it. Just going, like, all right, just fucking every one of the books is just a different chapter. And this long thing, no tie-ins, nothing like that. It's just one big thing. If you're going to do a franchise-wide event rather than a uh, an event book, I think this is definitely the way to go. Although I understand why they probably will never do it again, which is that this came out during COVID and it fucked everybody over uh, financially and schedulingly. Yeah. A comic book brought that up, in, but their back issues episode. Uh, Tiffany's good host. Uh... Yeah, I'm really like, I'm starting to like Tiffany more than Sal. A little bit. I like, I like how, how she's very nonchalant and just like, no, that's the way the thing are. Don't worry about it. We're going. And the guys are just like, okay. Yeah, because Sal goes like, okay, okay. let me explain comic book bullshit. Oh, he's fair. Sal's a lot like you, honestly. But he seems to have more interest in DC. He, he's very much like, okay, so uh, here's how, here's why this sequel to Watchmen was a dumb idea. I still say the Doomsday Clock is good. I, I enjoyed Doomsday Clock when I read it after you told me it was amazing. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, uh, X of Swords, really good, solid event. Now are you going to take your break before you burn yourself out? Or are you just going to keep going forward, hoping to get more of that, uh, sweet, sweet magic nuggets? I mean, I really have two choices before me. I can break until the rain is over and we're going into the next event. Or I can try and catch up and keep current. I mean, if you get up, keep current, that's only like one or two, two to three issues a week you have to keep up with. So, like, that does sound very enticing to me, but also it entirely depends on how the next week goes. I'm not going to make a promise either way in this episode. Also, if you keep current, then uh, then we can just talk about the current issues and not have to go, like, yeah. back and forth and me explain shit. It's Hickman X-Men segment! Oh, uh, yeah. So, do you read anything else? You want to talk about anything else, or should I just get on my comic book bullshit? You should just... I, I read... I read 22 issues in two nights. What do you think? You think and I read anything else? I am double checking, sir. <laughs> it's best to be prepared, sir. All right, sir. How about you, sir? Uh, so I read uh, Amazing Spider-Man issue number 68 of the current run. Legacy number 869. Nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> what did they used to call that? Stereo? Yeah, uh, and basically it's just continuation of last one. Um, Teresa Parker is dealing with uh, uh, the dude who killed her parents, but it's a hologram that's sit standing there, so she can't actually kill him. So they can continue that. Uh, we get an explanation for this, Ned. Um, so this isn't supposed to be the clone from Clone Conspiracy. This is a, the Ned who thought he was Hobgoblin, and the f and went on to the 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 adventure of Spider-Man versus Wolverine. And before he got killed in that issue, he took some Goblin formula, and then he got killed. And the Goblin formula basically kept him alive long enough that he could crawl out of his grave. That's the story that the, the, that he's going with right now. But I don't know how true it is because comics. Uh, and basically, he just reunited with Betty. Betty at a later time, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then Peter has to go rescue the, the lab partner he's been working on the, the future telling device with because he gets into some trouble and he runs into some bad guys, including an entire platoon of jack-o'-lantern. I really like how jack-o'-lanterns are just now like j j the generic, we need a bunch of mooks and power, and power armor, but we don't want them to just look like Iron Man ripoffs. <laughs> you know? Cause it, cause it's a good, it's Jack O' Lantern is a good ass fucking design to do that with, you know. I'm sending you the 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 last page of the book. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. Let's see. Then I read the latest issue of Spider Man Spider's Shadow. What if? And oh boy, this is going in a very interesting direction that I wasn't expect expecting. So J. Jonah Jameson's going out to a farm out in the countryside. 
And there he meets up with Mysterio, Craven the Hunter, Electro, and the Rhino, and the new Doc uh Doc Ock, who is Eddie Brock. Eddie Brock didn't get the Venom symbiote. Basically, somehow the Doctor Octopus arms attach themselves to Eddie Brock, and he's there as a member of the Sinister Six. And they're basically trying to lure Peter Parker there so they can kill him because he's gone off the deep end. You know? And uh Reed Richards is looking over all the science and going, like, oh man, we should have helped them sooner. Uh, and J. Jonah Jameson's doing all the things to help uh, try and figure out and talk to Brock and all figure out the plan. Uh, and Spider-Man basically scares the shit out of him by hanging up the dead corpse of Beetle between the trees. And they immediately start trying to fight him. And Mysterio has some cool-ass tech. I'm surprised I haven't seen it in any other comic where he gives the other villains... Uh, uh, goggles that see through his illusions so he can just ramp up the illusions to a hundred to fuck with Spider-Man. Is that like introduced here or do you think maybe he got that in Amazing Mary Jane because he was the villain of Amazing Mary Jane I heard. I have no idea but I just think it's a really cool idea that, that they uh, implemented here because they can all see reality as it is you know, uh, letting them kind of deal with it and basically Venom Spider-Man just fucking wrecks them all kingdom coming back and then j jonah jameson gets uh gets in a spider slayer suit and starts fighting him as best he can a house fire breaks out and it rips the the symbiote off of peter parker and peter parker is like he he's the venom symbiote is gone um and j jonah jameson pulls him out of the burning building and curryvin's about to stab him with a spear uh, because, like, no, we we haven't lost, we haven't won yet, we need to kill him, and J. Jonah Jameson just bops him over the head, going, like, no. And he just goes, like, why did it have to be you, Peter? And then they're driving back to New York. Peter's in the car going, like, oh my god, what have I done? Like, he is, he is, like, back, he's sane again, he is Peter Parker, going, like, oh man, oh, whatever, this is so bad, this is raw, what have I done? freaking out and J. Jonah J. Jameson goes like you didn't do this son and from what you said that suit made you a monster but that doesn't explain the previous 10 years of you being a wall crawling menace <laughs> that's good I like that. so J. Jonah Jameson pops back Peter back into the apartment where Mary Jane and Black Cat are talking because they haven't seen Peter in a couple weeks now uh oh and they're just talking, they're kind of just going, like, back and forth. And this is Black Cat when she was just wanting to fuck Spider-Man, not wanting to have anything to do with Peter. So she just keeps going, calling him Spider, Spider. And Mary Jane just goes, like, his name is Peter. Mm -hmm. Don't pretend uh, you know some other side better just because you dress like a ghost of college Halloween's past. Oh, so J. Jonah Jameson uh, pops in. Puts Peter down and he goes like I did. Peter's just going like, oh man, I I didn't I didn't want to do it. I couldn't break free of the suit. Uh, almost like I didn't want to. Like I was addicted to it. it oh, it's so bad. And then uh, police are outside because Spider Man's identity got revealed during this whole thing. Oh, okay. So they know where they sp know where Spider Man is. And then we see a sen uh, Venom symbiote in the Baxter Building, fucking up with the thing. Because the little bit that uh, Reed Richards has taken off of the symbiote earlier to study it has uncovered him, and he is now replicating symbiotes to turn the Thing and other Fantastic Four members into Venoms. Lovely. It's this is going in some cool directions. Oh, oh no! Yeah, boy. <laughs> uh, let's see. I also read Web of Spider Man. Uh, this is an alternate universe comic. It's not 616. Uh, because this is starring a young teenager Spider-Man based off of the MCU Spider-Man, uh, as he is working with uh, a couple of other super science teenagers of Marvel Comics, uh, including, uh, Lunetta, no moon girl, uh, mm. a girl from Wakanda, and, uh, a kid named Harley Kenner, who looks like, a the dude from Iron Man 3, it's the kid from Iron Man 3, because literally, 
hit from Iron Man Freeze in the comics now? That's awesome. I love him. It's not 616, but it's an alternate universe. But yeah, he's in the comics now because his bio says name Harley Kenner, origin Rose Hill, Tennessee, which is where he was in Iron Man 3. Uh Point of interest, friend of Tony Stark. That's sick. And basically, uh, Tony Stark is basically bankrolling a little like uh, teenage super genius uh, think tank. Where they can just make make things for superheroes, and they have a little they have a little uh, adventure, uh, uh, because like some holograms like come to life and start fucking with shit. They're hard light holograms, and they do stuff, and they figure it out. Also, their uh, liaison, their babysitter, is Squirrel Girl. Yeah. Squirrel Girl is such a great just like gag mom character to pull in every once in a while. Yeah. It's, it's not the best Squirrel Girl, but it's a solid Squirrel Girl. I can dig this Squirrel Girl. But yeah, no, as a as a kid-friendly uh, spider book, to just kind of be like, oh, here's some uh, kid fluff. It's not bad. Yeah, it works. It, it works on the same level that uh, Spidey and his amazing friends looks like it will. Did you, uh, did you catch the intro for that when it was going around earlier this week? No, why? Uh, it's basically a CGI um, superhero squad style kids cartoon that uh, centers around uh, Peter, Miles, and uh, Gwen, but they're all the same age, it looks like. Okay, weird. Yeah. That's not bad. Uh, also, I got caught up and finished Birthright. Okay. Have you? Do you have any idea what Birthright is as a comic? No. Okay, so uh, it's an image book. Uh, basically, a young kid gets whisked away to a dark and brutal fantasy world because he's the chosen one destined to kill the Demon King. That kind of story. Um, and his parents basically go like, lose him. His whole family life deteriorates. His parents almost get a divorce. Like They're starting the paperwork to do it. His brother's like, depressed whole nine yards one year after he disappeared this giant 25 to 27 year old man big buff bearded comes back to earth and goes like mom dad bro what's up that's the kid that uh, got lost all that years ago all that that year ago but the place that he went to time moves differently Mm. and like he's going like oh yeah no I was there to kill the demon lord, but like he came over here, and now we, now we got to travel America and solve it. And you're going like, okay, cool, neat concept. Turns out that's not the concept. The dude had made a deal with the demon lord dude to go back to Earth and give like Earth to him, just so he can be as long as he can be with his family. Technically, that was a ruse that the dude pulled. He did the deal just so he could get back to Earth and start actually trying to beat the bad guy but it's a really good like fantasy book it's, uh, it's only 50 issues if anybody wants to get into it but uh the last little only bit of it, 50 issues only fi- like dude how many issues of invincible are there a lot only 50 issues beginning middle and end like that's all you have to worry about no tie-ins nothing like that no events it's a, like good enough to, uh, good enough for a read um and basically, these last few issues was just kind of uh, given a last little bit of wrap up and epilogue where uh, throughout the book, his brother started learning magic uh, and they closed the portal to the other world and their parents got trapped in the other world and all that kind of stuff, you know, and uh, basically they try and get back to this place, all that jazz uh, so they can save their parents and the brother's going like, oh man, no, I fucked up. And it's like, oh, it's fine. We're, we're family. We get through this. And eventually they do get to the other world, save the parents. And the parents have been basically like k- taking care of some war orphans and that stuff. And the brother goes like, all right, I know a bunch of fucking magic. And this place needs a basically a super fucking powerful wizard to help it get on the right path. I need to stay here. Our parents are going to go back to Earth. We'll see each other one day. We've made it here once. We can make it here again. Uh, so long. Uh, take care of my family. And so the parents go back to Earth. Uh, the dude, his wife, and their kid are back on Earth. Uh, and the whole comic ends with uh, basically the the the, fam- the the dude, his wife, and the kid all playing in a forest. 
the same forest that he disappeared from and like they look away for a second and their daughter is gone and they're immediately going like no no fuck this magic bullshit they're not gonna take our daughter away they start freaking out it's like a couple pages of them just screaming in a forest for her and the final page of the entire book is the daughter running up to her parents hugging them and go like it's okay mom and dad i'm right here just going like no the evil is slain everybody gets a happy ending sick really good wholesome fan it's not wholesome but it's really good like solid fantasy stuff it sh- like it should be more it should be a more popular comic and i don't see it talked about a ton i i, I want it i want more people to know about this comic so g- people give it a go give it a try birthright is really fucking good also i'm sending a cover to you uh and it has really fucking good art my style but i can appreciate the work that goes into it it's very like the best way to describe it is it's very heavy metal fantasy mm-hmm. uh did you actually did you want to see that theme song for spidey and his amazing friends do a live reaction to it yeah, why don't we why don't you why don't you do that okay because i pulled it up so here okay hold on i'm also sending the the the, the panel i really like it's like goddamn. this is like other than all the fantasy bullshit that this guy has to go through, uh, and the pain and the suffering and PTSD of being a warrior in a fantasy world full of death, destruction, and monsters, you know, and then coming back to Earth and having to deal with all that shit again, but with your parents involved and your younger bro- and your formerly older brother, who's now, like, much younger than you because you spent a lifetime in a- another dimension. But yeah, just look at that. That's fucking goals. Happiness and family and all that shit. Yeah. Fit. It's adorable. All right, I'm starting the I'm starting the theme song. Okay. Oh, okay, this is adorable. This is it's a fucking bop, isn't it? Like this oh, is hey! a, Ms. Yeah. Marvel. Yeah, Miss Marvel, Hulk, and Black Panther. Like this legitimately looks like very much like superhero squad. I go, okay, I have zero interest in watching this myself, but kids are gonna fucking love this. That goblin's fucking adorable too. Mm-hmm. Oh, and they're Phoenix using Lady Doc with the fucking half shaved look. Oh, see, here's the thing. Part of me still goes like, "Oh man, Iceman should be there." Yeah, Iceman, Starfire. Maybe they'll make cameos. Maybe they'll be reoccurring side characters. That'd be fun. Um, uh, and then there's the two latest issues of a uh, Hellfire Gala where uh, fucked up shit happens. So this is uh, the first one's Excalibur, and basically it's the Excalibur team uh, going to the Hellfire Gala. Richter's just going like, "Ah, this is this is kind of bullshit. I don't want to go to a fucking party. This is dumb." And he's like, "Eh, fuck it. I'm doing this for I'm doing this for like the like to keep face and do all that kind of stuff, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff." And then his ex boyfriend shows up, who just got saved from Mojo World. Oh, and he just runs up bloodied, shirtless, only wearing pants, and ultimate warrior tassels around his biceps. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I read the 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 place where they established that a few weeks ago. Yeah, he just shows up, dips him in a very romantic pose, and goes, Hello, Julio. Surprise, my love. <laughs> I do shit. It is straight up campy romance novel wonderfulness i love it like fuck me man and uh and and richter does go like hey man you're covered in blood like we like we haven't been together in a while i haven't seen you i need to process this this is a thing we need to deal with we'll talk about it later damn uh and then it's after the reveal of the new x-men team uh Gambit is uh, congratulating Rogue, and he goes like, "You know what? Hey, I'm for glad listeners, I'm... what is the new X Men team? Uh, Sync, X twenty three, Wolverine, Cyclops, Jean Grey. I can't remember his name. Hold on, I'll give it to you in a second. Ba 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 ba. Uh, Rogue, Sunfire, X twenty three, Wolverine, Sync, Polaris, Jean Grey, and Cyclops." Uh, really cool, well-rounded team. But basically, Gambit's congratulating Rogue, going like, "Hey, uh, I'm gonna be a house husband. I'm happy about this. I'm gonna take care of the cats. I get to nap all day." And Rogue's is like, "Yeah, you get to be the house husband. I'm gonna take care of you." 
And they're it's like adorable. They're just really supportive of each other. It's really nice. Yeah. Uh and uh and basically Betty uh, Betsy goes like, Hey, Rogue, just because you're an X Men doesn't mean you're not welcome back in Excalibur. And she goes like, Yeah, I know. We'll be we'll be good. We'll be we'll be doing all that kind of stuff. And then um we see Richter is getting blackout drunk because he's just seen his ex that he didn't expect to see. <laughs> like they go like, Are you okay? No, I already wanted to blow this party for a dozen reasons. Then my ex appeared straight from MMA or something. I'm pretty fucking not okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, mood, Richter, mood. And then uh, Pete Wisdom comes in and goes like, Hey, Betsy, you want to dance? And they're going like, oh yeah, sexual tension, let's do this. So they start dancing. Uh, and basically, Pete goes like, hey... This isn't just a dance. I'm here to explain that uh, the evil coven that we were dealing with in Excalibur has trying to gain political power and discredit you as Captain Britain and basically uh, throw a wrench in this whole Britain working with Krakoa thing. They're one to renege on the agreements that they've made uh, that Britain has made, and they have a lot of political power now. So I'm trying to warn you of that. And basically, Betsy goes into the meeting that the that this ambassador is having with Professor Xavier. And uh, basically, the dude goes like, you abandoned us. Uh, you, Captain Britain, didn't serve Britain. Uh, and that kind of thing, you know. And he just goes like, you know, and basically goes like, Britain now reneges on our deals with Krakoa. We, uh, we, do, we reject Krakoa medicine. We do all that kind of stuff. Uh, and basically going, uh, hey, we'll take all the land that Excalibur has been using back because it's been on British land, the lighthouse and all that stuff. So we'll take that back now. Um, and basically Betsy goes like, nah, that's the domain of Captain Britain. I'm Captain Britain. Fuck you. you. Just because you're not happy about it doesn't mean I'm not Captain Britain. I defend Avalon and does all that kind of stuff. And so they start to leave and Pete Wisdom goes like, all right, cool, dude. Uh, I, I got to try and calm them down a little bit. He's going with them uh, back to England. We see uh, 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 the autobratic twin hanging out with his wife. They're uh, they're having fun. He's going like, "Oh man, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get some snacks. I'll be right back." Nightcrawler shows up, does his does his uh, charming thing because they're old friends. And he goes like, "Oh hey, you're pregnant." And he goes, she goes like, "Don't fucking tell him. You're he doesn't know. No one's supposed to know yet." Ooh, and what? I completely zoned out for like two minutes. I'm sorry. Okay, what'd you miss? What was the last thing you heard? I heard pregnant, and I was like, "What's going on?" Huh? Um, they're implying that uh, um, uh, what's his name? The other Braddock twin, not Betsy. I can't believe you're not Captain M Britain anymore. That's how I yeah. remember him. <laughs> basically, uh, it's being heavily implied that his wife Brian. is pregnant. Brian, 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 Brian Braddock. Yeah. Um, okay. Because Nightcrawler uh, kind of goes like, ah, I think you're pregnant. You know, is his wife thing. a mutant? Yes, his wife is a mutant. So this could potentially be the first post krakoa born mutant. Confirmed, at least. I mean, that kind of thing. Uh, is, Betsy. Oh, that's something I forgot to ask a couple weeks back when we did X2. Is Because they mentioned in X2 at, for a joke about Iceman's dad uh, that men carry the mutant gene. Is that a thing in comics, too? No idea. Don't think so. Not okay. sure if it's ever been confirmed or not. Uh, and basically, this is just like the OG Excalibur team reunion issue because Cyclops talk because not Cyclops, uh, Nightcrawler and Rachel kind of hang out for some time. Uh, uh, and Rachel and Betsy dance for a bit and just going like, "Oh man, I missed you. I miss having you around. We're gonna uh, we should hang out sometime. We should hang out soon." And then we get to uh, the the British ambassador and the coven, the evil coven that. Uh, he's been working with and doing all that kind of stuff. And they're going like, all right, cool. So we have a plan. We're going to bring back Morgan Le Fay so we can have our evil magic so we can fuck over Betsy Braddock uh, uh, and not make her Captain Britain so Britain can be cool and powerful and everything again. And we just need a sacrifice. A mutant sacrifice. Hey, grab Pete Wisdom. They grab him, pull him onto a fucking slab of stone and fucking sacrifice him. They kill Pete Wisdom. He's but he's a mutant. But he is a mutant. And this might be like the way he, like the justification for him going to Kakoa. Uh, all that kind of stuff. But Morgan Le Fay does come back. We see all the aftermath of all that stuff. 
uh, Monarch is dealing with stuff in another world. The Coven are dealing with it. They're just going like, ah, we have mutant blood on our hands. It's great. Uh, and Richter just goes and goes like, hey, Druid, I need your help. England's going to fuck us over. Let's turn this into an island that Kokoa can own. So they use all this mutant energy and magic and they make a brand new island. And then, after he's done all this dope shit, Shatterstar rolls up clean. He's not bloody anymore. He's he's taken a shower. He's done the whole thing. And Richter just goes like, Shatterstar, hey. And then Shatterstar goes, it's nearly morning, but uh, I wanted to try again. I didn't feel he teleported in. I took the gate. Uh, Julio, I've lost my manners. I should have just asked to have a drink sooner. Yeah, that would be a start. Come on. Let me show you this beach I just made. And then we end with them, like, touching heads and that kind of like, oh, we're just relaxing and we're touching each other kind of way. It's really nice and sweet. It's really cute. Nice. Uh, and then we have X-Men, which, oh boy, this does some shit. So we open on Namor on the balcony getting served some more wine and more champagne and all that kind of stuff. And uh, Professor Xavier and Magneto come out and go like, hey, so Namor, what do you think of what we're doing? And he goes like, you know what? It's not it's not bad. Because, uh, because they're going like, hey, yeah, you grace us with your presence. We're, we're honored and humbled. So Namor goes like, so how's the empire building? Very <laughs> straight to the point, all that kind of stuff. And Xavier kind of plays this like, ah, we're thinking more long term. It's more alliances than it is like Empire, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, to but that actually, end, we will take over the whole world because we are the dominant life form on the planet. But we're not. We're we're, be, we're playing the long game. We're not doing it with. We're not doing it with violence and all that kind of stuff. We're doing. You know, we're taking our time. Uh, to that end, have you reached the inevitable time when you throw your lot in with ours? And Magneto then goes, if it's a question of influence, changes are coming to the Quiet Council. We can offer you a seat. And then fucking Namor takes the knife and just goes like, <laughs> you think? And Namor just goes like, offer? I think if I stepped one foot in your council chamber, there would be a rush to surrender a seat to me, even if one were not available. Frauds tend to flee at the sight of a true aristocrat. I am a real king. Eric, never forget that. Then Charles goes like, then you should, you should, you should return home. You are a mutant like us. You should be among your people. And then Namor goes, I tell you truly, Charles, at night when I dream, I dream of this entire world under my thumb. My seat, me seated on throne of thrones and the people, human, mutant, and all living things under the sun. They cry out and cheer with love and affection for the blind can truly see as a, me as I really am. Which I assure you is not being on a council with those who pretend to be my peers. I have dominion over 70% of this planet, gentlemen. You currently control what? An island? Get back to me when you have something to offer as he walks over to the Avengers to mingle. God damn. The dick on Namor. No wonder Sue keeps looking. Jesus fucking Christ. That are, that's just like. No wonder Hickman keeps writing him. It's so good. It's such it's such a way to keep like Magneto and Professor Xavier like deflated to an extent. And then we have uh, the showcase of the X-Men as uh, they start to go like, hey, mutants of Earth, here are your X-Men. Uh, we're doing this. Not fucking decide, by the way. Was it just obligatory? No, what they're doing is Jean Grey is basically connecting the minds of every mutant and are holding an, uh, an immediate, like, psychic vote. Not, like, consciously, but it's more of, like, who should be a member of the X-Men. It's kind getting of thing. a feeling. Yeah. And basically, all the non-mutants are going, like, oh, man, uh, this feels a little awkward. Uh, what's going on? And Dr. Strange goes, hey, don't don't be worried. They're just doing their mutant thing. They're actually embracing being a mutant and not having to run and run away in fear. I can see the psychic plane. I can see what they're doing. They're all voting for mutants. Don't worry it's about cool. it. It's cool. Don't upset them. I need Ileana to take over after, I mean, teach at my school. <laughs> and then, uh, freaking fracking, uh, Johnny goes, like, should we be listening, though? It, it seems like it might be a private thing it just feels wrong and then um i can't remember uh, this might be cersei 
I don't rem- I, I don't know who this might be. Uh, no, no, it's not uh, Kawan. It's not her. But it's um, they they just go like uh, they're shouting. This isn't meant to be hidden. They're doing this with pride. And uh, then basically the vote gets counted. It's Rogue, Sunfire, Wolverine, Sync, Polaris, Jean Grey, and Cyclops. And they're having a big old, big old party. Oh, there's George R. R. Martin. <laughs> no, because they Marvel gave out a list of like celebrity cameos that they're planning on putting in, and one of them was George R. R. Martin. And I was and like I was I haven't seen him yet, so I was wondering where he would be. Uh, and he's right here. I'm sending the page where he's on. Also, Eminem's on it too. Yeah. And Method Man? No, that's not Method Man. That's either, that's either Method Man or Ghostface Killer. It's kind of I'm trying to figure it out. Hey. I don't know. Hold on. No, I don't think it. I think it is Method Man. No, maybe it is. I don't know. Hold on. Let me uh, go back. The Wu Tang have... shirt behind Eminem. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's cool. Rapper man. Can we talk about Kevin Feige? Okay. Uh, we get down to it. Uh, we're, basically, uh, this one dude's trying to get a drink at the bar. Cyclops whirls up and goes like, "Hey, man, let me help you out." Hey, Jamie, get a get a get a drink for the room. You know that whole thing. And then Kevin Feige rolls up and goes like, "Hey, what's your story?" And Cyclops then says, well, it's complicated. And let me just read you what Cyclops says, because goddamn it, it's beautiful. I was blind, blind to how the world worked. And then I met a man who taught me to see, see how things really were. I loved him for that. And because I loved him, because I believed in him, and in a way worshipped him, I claimed the things that he had faith in as my own. He called it his dream. It was a good one. But the world, you see, the waking world, where we all live is a killer of dreams, a destroyer of things you believe in. So when I grew older, I realized it was a foolish it was foolish to deify him. Honestly, it's unfair to expect that kind of perfection from anyone. After all, we're all flawed and imperfect. There's no real difference between any of us, no matter how much we believe the lie there is. You see, he wasn't a savior, he was just a man, a mutant like me. And his dreams, which still make me smile to this day, are no more valid than anyone else's, including mine. I love the idea of that, the promise of that. So what's my story? I'm a dreamer. I'm an X-Man. You guys have a good night. God damn! That's pretty good. Oh. Um, also, I want I, I need to know. Is this character explicitly stated to be Kevin Feige, or is it just generic guy who looks like Kevin Feige? It is implied to be Kevin Feige, but they never officially say his name. But dude, it's Kevin it's the Feige. Fucking one, that's the one above all. Fuck you. That's the one above all. Fuck it. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> he's hidden. Oh, let's spread that as canon. Let's he's, not because we don't want to get dropping. He's just dropping in to do a director cameo. Hickman, Hickman deadass went, ah, I don't want to look like, I don't want to put myself in the comic. That's too pretentious. I'll just look like Feige. <laughs> yeah. But nah, it's good. It's good shit. And really hyping it up. Uh, it seems like the gala was a good time. There's still new, more gala to go. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, no. Uh, there's still Planet Size X-Men, New Mutants, X-Corp, Wolverine, Sword, Way of X, X-Factor Cable. Basically, the way they're doing it is, like, they're just jumping in between the whole night. Like, they'll jump between different times throughout the whole different comics. So it's really cool. So it's it's another X of Swords style thing. Where it's yeah, but it's hitting less... every book. It's less linear. They're jumping back and forth as they need. Interesting. Yeah. So that's what I read this week. I'm trying to figure out who that Wu-Tang Clan member is. He has to know. He has to know before the episode ends. Or he'll turn into a pumpkin. Mm. Uh, I mean, I'm getting the thing where Method Man was cosplaying Bishop. Have you seen that? It was really dope. I think I have. I'm not sure. Yeah, Method Man cosplaying Bishop. Because, like... Most of the members of Wu-Tang Clan are, like, big fucking nerds. It's great. <laughs> nice. Um, no, like, Ghostface Killer has a, another rap named Tony Starks. Oh, yeah, cousin of Ricky Starks. Uh, it is Method Man. It is Method Man. Also Patton Oswald. Yeah, I know it's Patton Oswald. That's cool. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a neat, like, it makes sense to have, like, celebrity cameos in a thing like this. You know? Yeah. Totally makes sense. So... Any final things you want to talk about? Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow drops next week. Tomorrow, when you're listening to this. We are so close. 
We are on the very precipice of greatness. I honestly don't know if I'm ready. We'll just have to see. Man, man, oh man. Who knows? There's the either going he... to be there's either going to be a lot of screaming and anger or a lot of screaming and simping next week. Inevitably, we are reaching deprived levels of sympathy that have not been seen since the beginnings of the Oli Fan era. <laughs> it's uh the next episode of No Prize Podcast will be beyond science. Oh man. Oh man, and if you start reading more X-Men stuff and you get to some uh Magic? Oh man, Magic and Supergirl all together, all in one week. Can we handle it? I, right now, my entire being is just that that fucking panel of Spider-Man straddling the giant grenade, about to pull pull off the pin and going, "Dare I?" <laughs> so why don't you tell the people where they can find you so they can see you're simping in live? HD hey, quality. Hey, everybody. I'm the Bad Cuminator. I've done a lot of things in my YouTube career, but right now I'm a classic behind the camera style toy reviewer. Uh, I've been doing a, a, a number of, of different toy reviews, but you can uh, see my latest one this dropping this Wednesday. Uh, hey, kind of comic related because the, uh, the, the modern idea of G.I. Joe, the post-70s idea of G.I. Joe actually originates from the offices of Marvel Comics. Didn't know if he knew that. But, uh, but it will be um, a review of the G.I. Joe classified series Red Ninja, which is uh, the, 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 the ninja army builder for that franchise. So uh, if you want to hear me, see me, watch me talk about that on Wednesday, go to youtube.com slash the vacuuminator spelled T-H-E-B-A-C-U-U-I-M-I-N-A-T-O-R. Follow me on Twitter at the Vacuuminator and on Instagram at the underscore Vacuuminator. Before we continue, I just want to point out George R. R. Martin's in a Marvel comic book. Uh -huh. You know the first thing that George R. R. Martin ever written and got published was a Marvel comic book. No, a letter to the editor for Fantastic Four. Sick. So like it's just kind of like a nice little like hey, it's cute. It's all a rich tapestry, buddy. Oh man, I do agree. I do love your idea of that Kevin Feige being the one above all, going like, "All right, cool, all right." I uh, I want to tell this story somewhere else. Let me get a let me get a vibe for it real quick. I'm a different one above all. I'm a different <laughs> member of the editorial team. In your own words, uh, how did you this thing? I how do you this thing I made feel about yourself? That's what that scene is. Yeah, and I I like how Cyclops is basically like, "Yeah, no, we uh, I'm doing like." I, I recognize better more. You know, all that kind of stuff. It's cool. Uh, hey, howdy, howdy. I'm Chris Boingle Ryder Gaston, you know, the host of this podcast. Hi. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> I do video essays and editorial type content on my YouTube channel. You can find it at Boingle Ryder. Um, you put that in fucking the YouTube search bar. You know how YouTube works, buddy boy, buddy boy. Uh, Follow me on Instagram and on the Twitter at Boingo underscore writer. That's where I post other stuff, I guess. Uh, and you can join my Discord server. A link to that is in the description. Uh, and if you're listening to this on a podcasting platform, hey, why don't you give it a follow? Tell people about it. That's the best way to help us out. Uh, and, and, if you're watching, listen, you're watching this, you're listening, watching this on YouTube, hey, give this video a like. Give it a comment. Tell us what you thought about, uh, the first episode of Loki. Tell us what you think about Vax majority of simping. Tell us what you think about the latest toy news. As opposed to my minority of simping. Your minor simping is on wrestling. Your minor simping is on MMWP. Because you know, like, keep it... Cause I, you respect, can't... I simp respectfully on MMWP because those are real people. <laughs> also, everything moves so fast you can't focus on the simping. You just gotta go like, oh shit, the moves. Dude, I have, I have, there have been moments you just haven't noticed yet. Thank God your camera is pointing at your face and not your entire body. Why do you think I did that? But if you're on YouTube, give us a like, give us a comment, give us a subscribe so you can keep up with this podcast and a couple others, including, but not limited to, MMWP, where we talk about professional wrestling that Louie liked in the week, modular components, where we talk about a variety of subjects and just kind of hang out for a little bit. And of course, the last podcast of Note and Mention, hosted by 
I'm Me, the this. Vacuuminator, and uh, Miriam of Buster Cord, This Week in Toku, uh, Twit, we talk about Tokusatsu. You're getting tired, aren't you? I'm I'm honestly starting to get pretty dazed. Uh, All right, but, cool. uh, Do you like Power Rangers? Have you heard of Kamen Rider Super Sentai and slash or Ultraman? Go like listen to gun? Twit. Fuck you. <laughs> Go listen to Twit. Oh, fuck. I'm thinking about that show now. I hate you so much. I am the king of psychic damage. Hey, uh, Majo Kabutis is really good psychic damage. Uh, but that's about it.